our first honoree who has a, a flight to catch, um, a red eye. So um, let's see, here to accept FFRF's 2014 Free Thought Heroin Award is Marcy A. Hamilton. And we're thrilled to have her here. Marcy is one of the nation's leading state church scholars. She holds the Paul R. Vercule Chair at Benjamin Cardozo School of Law, Yeshiva University, and she is known for her passionate and persistent defense of child sex abuse victims of religious organizations. She's been arguing uh, on their behalf in these cases where dioceses are claiming bankruptcy, very conveniently. She was one of the earliest to favor legislative reform to protect child sex abuse victims. She's a columnist on constitutional issues. She's been at finelaw.com. Um, she's had a weekly column for pathius.com. She's been writing a bi-monthly column for justia.com. And her newest blog is Hamilton and Griffin on Rights, which focuses on religious liberty, women's rights, and children's rights. And she hosts www.rfraperils.com because she's really been the leading voice to sound the alarm about the perils of the so-called Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And this tracks all 50 states and the federal government. And Marcy Hamilton is the leading critic of RIFRA, the so-called Religious Freedom Restoration Act, cited by the Supreme Court in its ruling in favor of Hobby Lobby. And we were thrilled to have Marcy Hamilton represent FFRF as well as many victims' rights organizations in our amicus brief against the Hobby Lobby challenge before the US Supreme Court. And boy, was that noticed. Marcy was in the New York Times for that uh, amicus brief. And um, she's served as constitutional law counsel in many important clergy sex abuse and religious land use cases. And um, she's the leading national expert on child sex abuse statutes of limitation. And um, she has done other uh, amicus briefs. She is also the author of a book that we have here today, God Versus the Gavel, Religion and the Rule of Law. And it's just been reprinted and updated very timely because of the Hobby Lobby ruling. It's won a lot of awards and uh, couldn't come at a more crucial time um, when we are seeing the term religious liberty appropriated by the theocrats to mean that they have their right to impose their religion on the rest of us. Also, I think this is absolutely fascinating, Marcy clerked for Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. <laughs> and um, it's gonna be seen in a couple of weeks. And so we're really, really delighted to finally have the opportunity to meet Marcy in person and thank her for her advocacy of freedom from religion in government. And we have an award. The Free Thought Heroin Award. Hi, everyone. It's an honor to be here. I was thrilled when uh, Andrew originally contacted me to ask me. Uh, if I thought that anybody was going to talk about constitutionality. And to be honest, I had decided I'd had enough of the RIFRA wars. I've been inside them for 20 years. I was going to do nothing in a Hobby Lobby. And uh, once Andrew asked me if anybody was doing anything, I said, yeah, I guess I will. <laughs> um, and thanks to Annie for inviting me. Uh, and thanks for this wonderful honor. It really means a lot to me. Um, you know, as I was listening to the story about the Bibles in the hotels, I was thinking back when I first published God Versus the Gavel, I was on the Jon Stewart show, and I was having my makeup done, and my eyes were closed, and all of a sudden I heard this voice behind me saying, what do you think about evangelicals not wanting the Gideon's Bible in the hotels? They want their Bibles. And I was like, who is that? Uh, that was Jon Stewart. And uh, luckily, I didn't say, who are you? But, uh, but you know, these issues are constant in our society. 
and we're getting it to a more pitch level. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is being inside the RIFRA war, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act war. You know, I have been fighting uh, for uh, 20 years now the idea that religious believers and institutions have the right to harm others. And that is really what is wrong with the current balance between church and state in the United States. We've created a, a culture of narcissistic religious believers who believe sincerely that their rights should trump anybody else's rights, that they're right and everybody else is wrong. So it was very refreshing when I was reading Free Thought today on the airplane to read the crank mail. <laughs> the person next to me thought I'd lost my mind. Um, this was, I had two favorites. One was, I am a high school student who is also a Christian. Your organization is making it hard for me to express my religion in public. No, it's not. Um, thanks, this, this makes me very angry. I would really appreciate if you let us believe in our God, the God who holds the universe in his hand, let us be pro-life, and let us not believe in the lifestyle of homosexuals. <laughs> they own the public square, right? There's no, there's no surfeit of talk. There's lots of talk about religion in the United States. There's never been more talk about religion in the United States. This talk of the public square is just more of the games, of the attempt to own the public square rather than share it. But then my other favorite one was, my goal is to destroy, dissolve this organization. 75% of Americans claim to be of a Christian faith, which makes us the majority. And in a traditional democratic republic, <laughs> the majority rules. When the majority unites, we will smash this website organization or company like the sledgehammer to an ant. You know, what that reminded me of was James Madison, who crafted the First Amendment, and he repeatedly said things that the religious lobbyists don't want to repeat. And the two insights he had, which are a response to that person, are that the greatest thing to fear in a Republican democracy is faction. And when he used the word faction, he meant interest groups. But at the same time, he also said that in the memorial and remonstrance that we must be aware and be concerned about ecclesiastical est establishments. With the framing of the First Amendment, he understood that the problem for religion and the problem of religion is that we need freedom, but we also need disestablishment. He believed that people who were believers would overreach. And of course, that whole generation believed it. Why wouldn't they? They escaped Europe because they were being oppressed for their religious beliefs, but many of them came over here and oppressed others, not knowing any other way. And it's really the miracle of the First Amendment and frankly, the way the Supreme Court's interpreted it that has created the diversity and the right to be or not to be a believer in the United States. I always tell my students that one of the most interesting aspects of the Constitution is there's only one absolute right in the entire Constitution. Every other right the government can trump. The one absolute right is the right to believe anything you want. That is the miracle of the United States. And that's the right that is protected regardless of what the government ever tries to do. So how did I get into this crazy RIFRA war? I was clerking for Justice O'Connor the year that Employment Division versus Smith was decided. That case was used as the launching pad for extreme religious liberty statutes. That case was very simple. It involved two drug counselors who used illegal drugs as part of a religious service, one of them a believer, one of them just going, and got fired. When you're a drug counselor, you're not supposed to use illegal drugs. And the Supreme Court said, in the vast majority of our cases, 
we have said that if there is a law that's neutral, it's not discriminatory, and it applies to everybody who does the same thing, that that law is constitutional. That description by the Supreme Court of their own jurisprudence was correct. It was true. And I can tell you as a clerk that year, none of us thought that Smith was going to be the most uh, politically important case of the year. No one thought much of it at all. But it was the religious lobbyists who jumped on the minute Smith came down and said, oh, no, no, that's not, oh, that is not what the standard was. No, 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 no. You are wrong. You, you know what, since the Supreme Court's so stupid not to know its own cases, we're going to go across the street, go to Congress, and we'll say to Congress, you know what, you need to restore religious liberty. So you get Orrin Hatch and Ted Kennedy, right? They are the two that make it happen. And what they are given, what they're presented by the religious lobbyists, is the so-called, the most brilliantly named statute in American history, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Restoration is a lie. It was not restoring anything that had been in place before. It was putting in place what the religious litigants had been trying to get for years. So it's 1990, Employment Division versus Smith comes down. The religious groups start going around and saying, Smith is the end of religious liberty, the sacrifice of religious liberty. It's over. The United States has abandoned religious liberty. They get Congress on board. But what's worse is they get the ACLU, People for the American Way, and Americans United for Separation of Church on board, too. Everybody thinks this is a wonderful thing to restore religious liberty. So it is now 1993, three years of lobbying, three years of testimony by members of religious groups, 450 pages of telling, the, of telling Congress that the Supreme Court was stupid that the Supreme Court didn't know its own doctrine, didn't even know what its own cases said, and that it was wrong. The members of Congress are saying to each other, you know, if the ACLU and the Christian Legal Society are on the same page, we cannot go wrong. This has to be good. And the ACLU and People for the American Way and Americans United Right? None of them do the deep digging. None of them, forget deep digging, none of them read a few cases and figure out that, in fact, RIFRA was a lie. It wasn't restoring anything. It was creating a new extreme religious liberty standard that was now going to make it so that religious believers could trump virtually every law in the country. That's the standard that was being enacted. The law schools were teaching that the standard in RIFRA was the standard all along, but it was the standard they wanted. It wasn't the standard at the court. And how do, how do I prove this? Well, first, you know, you could read those cases, but barring that, it's 1993, all right? The Supreme Court decides Church of Lukumi Babalu IA v. City of Hialeah. The first case the court has ever had in which it does look like you have real religious discrimination, in which the city of Hialeah has banned animal sacrifice so that the Santerians can't practice their religion, but they've not done anything about kosher slaughtering, which is virtually the identical practice with the animals. This looks like not a neutral or generally applicable law. So in this case, the church argues the following. The government cannot enforce that law against us unless the government can prove it has a compelling interest. And the government has to show that their regulation is the least restrictive way of regulating for these believers. 
In other words, the test that was suggested to the Supreme Court was that every law had to be tailored closely to the demands of the believer. That was a 1993 request by the church. The Supreme Court rejected it. The Supreme Court said, yes, when we have a situation and you are targeting religion, government, when there's targeting of religion, yes, the government must prove a compelling interest, and that's, that's part of the tradition. But we're not going to make it the least restrictive for this believer. The world can't be shaped to one believer. Why? Because with the first free exercise case in Reynolds, involving polygamy in 1878, the Supreme Court had said, no one may be a law unto themselves. And the Supreme Court in 1993 said that. Five months later, RIFRA was signed into law by President Clinton and celebrated as a restoration of the standard that had been in place before. But RIFRA has the standard the court rejected in the Lukumi case. It is the same standard. So then we get a federal statute that says anybody who comes up against any law in the country, if you can show you have a religious belief that is being substantially burdened by that law, in that circumstance, the government now has this extraordinary burden of proving that that law had to have been passed for this compelling, highly important interest, and it is the least restrictive means for this believer. That law has to be tailored to this believer. So that's the RIFRA that President Clinton signs into law in 1993. It's a long story. Uh, it's pretty serendipitous. Um, but I end up challenging RIFRA at the Supreme Court. It was my first case. It was actually my first oral argument. But I clerked there. I knew the justices. And in Bernie v. Flores, I, rec I represented the city of Bernie, Texas. 1997, and in the city of Bernie, Texas, a Catholic church was in the historic preservation district, and they wanted to demolish the church and build basically a box. And the city of Bernie said, no, no boxes. You have to keep the front of that building. If you don't keep the front of that building, then it doesn't fit in with the historic district. So they started negotiating. Right? And so they got to the point where one side was saying, you need to keep 70%, the facade 70% back. That would be the city. And the church had said, no, we'll keep the facade and 50% 50 50 back. Now, it does not take a genius to know the middle ground between 70% back and 50% back. It's pretty much 60, right? RIFRA is passed into law. Now the Archbishop of San Antonio invokes RIFRA in this lawsuit and says, we don't have to abide by your historic preservation law. We have rights we never had before. I take RIFRA to the Supreme Court, and I represent the city of Bernie. And one of my favorite parts of representing the city of Bernie is that the mayor was a Methodist minister. And he was 100% behind challenging the Religious Freedom Restoration Act because he thought it was wrong, that this was not the standard. This was not the right way to treat a city that's just trying to preserve its historical preservation. So we argued it was unconstitutional in about five different ways. And the Supreme Court ruled in a 6-3 decision that RIFRA was unconstitutional in virtually every way that we had argued. In fact, the decision basically reads like the brief. The problem was, uh, once that decision came down, the religious lobby is shifted, largely at that point the Beckett Fund, they shifted. It used to be Smith was the worst decision in history, now it was going to be the Bernie case. And they went back to Congress. The religious lobbyists went back to Congress. And they said, we want it all over again. We'll, we'll do a few touch-ups, and we'll just get the same law again. Well, by that point, groups 
that fight religious groups on a daily basis in our society had made themselves known to me. The American Academy of Pediatrics, National Association of Regulatory Agencies, every prison, group, every prison uh, authority in the country, the attorneys general, the governors, the mayors. I was being contacted from all over the country and all of them said, this law cannot be passed again. This law is a nightmare. And frankly, uh, I didn't know that many people lobbied against religion. I had no idea. Uh, but I was really taken with people like Rita Swan with Children's Healthcare as a Legal Duty Child who deals with medical neglect. And I was persuaded that uh, it was not just a bad constitutional idea, this RIFRA, but also that it was just bad law. It was just a bad policy. So I testified against it. I had members of Congress tell me, oh, we know it's unconstitutional, but we have to pass it anyway. Um, I, I don't testify if I don't have to anymore, um, because that's the game. If, if you are a constitutional law professor, the reason you're being asked to testify is to give someone cover. And if you don't know who it is, don't do it. Um, so, the, uh, so what we get is we've got children's groups, but now we have other groups who are coming out of the woodwork and the ACLU starts to wake up. The ACLU figures out that in fact, RIFRA was passed originally largely at the urging of the Christian Legal Society so that their members could engage in discrimination in housing against unmarried couples, unmarried mothers, and same-sex couples. That was the game. They were losing the battle on fair housing, the Christian Legal Society and other conservative Christian groups. They needed RIFRA to be able to discriminate. And so if they didn't have RIFRA, they wanted to go back and have another RIFRA. And finally, the ACLU woke up a little bit, just a little bit. Then they blink, so don't get too excited. Um, so it's 1997 to 2000, and there's back and forth. First, they try to pass just RIFRA redux, and it does not make it. And the reason it doesn't make it is everybody knows that this is a law that's intended to undermine civil rights. And so the House passes it 308, uh, something up to 117 or something. It's not unanimous at all. But then the Senate won't even let it come to a vote. So then they figure out, well, they, they're not going to be able to do this all over again. So now we have a true deal with the devil, if you believe in the devil or not. Here's the deal. The civil rights groups say, you know what? You can have RIFRA as applied to federal law because the federal civil rights don't apply to the LGBT community, right? Title VII doesn't protect for sexual orientation. But states were starting to. And so if they would agree that they wouldn't pass a law that would affect state civil rights for the LGBT community, if that would happen, then the ACLU would back this. In other words, the ACLU agreed to a law that had the potential to attack federal civil rights, but they were willing to let it go if it just didn't do anything to the LGBT community. Then Dobson and Colson came into the picture. Dobson came in and said, I want land use. I, you know, I, I'm tired of having to deal with all these cities and all these permits and everything. Chuck Colson of Watergate fame came in for prison fellowship ministry saying, uh, we really need to be able to control the prisons. So it's July 27, 2000. I get a call. We are told the morning of July 27, 2000, it's the last day of the session before the summer recess, that they're going on recess. We need to start putting together the panels because there's going to be hearings from the opponents to RIFRA in September. And so that's what we're doing that Friday. We're starting to talk about who will be testifying. We'll bring in Mayor Giuliani had asked to testify. Senator Patrick Moynihan had asked to testify. All of the National League of Cities, the International Municipal Lawyers Association, there were a lot of people that wanted to explain what was wrong with this law. 
that night, I get a phone call from a reporter. And the reporter says, did you know that RIFRA and Arlupa just passed? I said, no, they're on summer recess. He said, you better talk to someone, because I just heard it, they passed. So as soon as they went into recess and the opponents among the members had left town, leadership took RIFRA and the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, which is RIFRA applied to land use and applied to prisons. They took that package and they passed it by unanimous consent in the House and then they ran it to the Senate. Unanimous consent is the phrase that is used by Congress when you have leadership bring a bill up, no quorum, no roll call, and no requirement of anybody being there but about a handful. So a handful of members of the House and the Senate, they hired a courier to run it from the House to the Senate before anybody found out what was going on, passed it. And to this day, they say they passed it unanimously. I have become, that is just my pet peeve. Any reporter that buys that propaganda, I'm on the phone. How in the world could you not do the research to figure out that it wasn't unanimous? Well, they told me. I said, well, shut up. Do your work. I, if anybody would do their homework, I'd be so happy. Um, it, it was not passed unanimously, ever, ever. It was passed by unanimous consent in 1993 in the House. It was passed 97 to 3 in the Senate. It was passed by unanimous consent in both houses in 2000. Never a roll call, never a quorum. So that is the bill that is so beloved and that everybody says, well, how can you be against something that everybody loved? Uh, well, because it's a bad bill. So at the same time there in the federal, in, in Congress trying to get a new federal RIFRA, the Rutherford Institute fanned out 50 groups of people into the 50 states, into the 50 state capitals in order to get state RIFRAs. So the idea was that this super strict standard that would apply to government and halt all laws for any religious believers, if we couldn't get it at the federal level, we'll do it at the state level. And that had mixed results. Uh, California was killed twice. Uh, partly because someone accidentally faxed me the Christian Legal Society's letter explaining the fair housing point, which I had not known up till that point. Once I knew that, once I could explain it to everybody, it died in California. The group in California that really killed it were the juvenile justice judges. They were very concerned about custody decisions and family decisions and how a RIFRA would torque that away from what's best for the child. But it's now in place in 20 states. So we now have 20 state RIFRAs. We have a federal RIFRA that only applies to federal law. And we have our LUPA applying to land use at the local and state level and prisons. So the Affordable Care Act shows up. And conservatives don't like it, to put it mildly. But it's declared constitutional. So they can't wipe it out with the Supreme Court. So how can you attack it? You look for the tools available. And the tool available was RIFRA. You get the Koch brothers, money, who, <laughs> who uh, founded the Cato Institute. You get the Greens money, and you get the Alliance Defending Freedom and the Beckett Fund, and what do you get? You get an argument that Hobby Lobby, which sounds like a mom and pop operation, uh, has, but has 3.3 billion in annual sales, 23,000 employees, and over 600 stores. They're religious. They come in and say they're religious. Those of us who are on the inside are saying, uh, no, they're not. 
Uh, I was there. I know that we discussed that Exxon would never be thought to be religious, that a large for-profit, non-religious corporation was not going to have the benefit of RIFRA. We knew that. That was the deal that was cut. But the Dictionary Act defines the terms in every federal statute. And they had chosen person as the rights holder in RIFRA, and in the Dictionary Act, a corporation is a person. It's true. It was either brilliant drafting or blind drafting. Either way, the Supreme Court, uh, you know, Justice Scalia's favorite resource is a dictionary. And this was the Dictionary Act, so you really can't beat that. So we get a ruling that says that this humongous corporation, with all of its political power, has the right to refuse to provide contraception that it believes is an abortifacient, which is not scientifically an abortifacient. It has the right not to include four types of contraception in its coverage. So, let me explain how RIFRA gets you to that unbelievable result, which in my view is a violation of those women's civil rights against gender discrimination and religion discrimination. They're being discriminated against because they don't believe what their employers believe. So there are three things, and you know, I apologize, but it's not my fault RIFRA is just legalese. RIFRA is the concoction of a legal standard that has never existed before, but it's all terminology that's been pasted together from Supreme Court constitutional cases. So the first thing that has to happen is the believer has to prove that there's a substantial burden on their conduct. Okay, normally substantial has had quite a bit of bite to it. Substantial means substantial, not de minimis. In this case, an employer who's putting money into fungible funds who will never know if an employee ever uses any contraception, let, let alone the ones they don't like because of the HIPAA rules, it's a federal law that that employer can't know what his employees do with their medical decisions. That employer who is not being told that he has to use it or that his family has to use it Right. This is about five times removed from any violation of his religious liberty. Right. And the Supreme Court, five of them say, well, that's a burden. <laughs> and it's a substantial burden. They water down substantial burden. I've litigated religious land use cases for cities all over the country. I have litigated RIFRA cases. I have never seen substantial burden interpreted in that attenuated, non-burden way. But if they prove substantial burden, then it has to trigger. Then the Supreme Court says, well, does the government have a compelling interest in women having cost-free access to contraception? And the, the majority can't bring themselves to say that there is a compelling interest in that. They say, we'll assume it. Because they get to the part of the test that is impossible for the government to win, the least restrictive means. What is the least restrictive means for women to have cost-free contraceptive coverage that won't substantially burden the Greens' belief that four types of contraception are abortifacients when they're not? That's the question, right? And the court has the answer. The least restrictive means is for the government to pay for it. Now the government, that's not in the statute. The government has not allocated any funds to cover what the Greens aren't paying or what the other 49 for-profit corporations are asking for since Hobby Lobby was decided. There are 49 corporations involved in the following religious activities. The Cherry Creek Mortgage Company the AutoCam Corporation, which is a specialty precision automobile parts company. Freshway Foods, Eden Foods. I mean, they have Eden, but that doesn't make them religious. <laughs> uh, a mining company, 
I, I, the Seneca Hardwood Company, senior living center owners, all of these corporations are now invoking Hobby Lobby to say that they have the right not to provide health care that serves the compelling interest of women's health. Here is the single most important point I'm going to make tonight, by far. RIFRA is not establishing a constitutional rule. It's not a constitutional standard. It is a statute. It's just a statute. So when you see talk about RIFRA, what you see is politicians saying, I'm in favor of the rights, right? It's statutory rights. It's not constitutional rights. So in this country right now, each of us has a right under the Constitution to be free from discrimination from the government based on our beliefs and uh, to have the government treat us like everybody else. If we engage in conduct and anybody else does the same thing, we're all treated alike. And if the government discriminates against us, then the First Amendment kicks in, big time. But we also have a RIFRA right. And the RIFRA right is sui generis, it's made up, it's on its own, and it needs to be repealed. It is the wrong standard. <laughs> so uh, not only have we had Affordable Care Act, uh, 49 cases pending, but we've also had some rather entertaining cases uh, I mean, if you have a really sick sense of humor and nothing to do. Uh, so the fundamentalist Mormons argued that they cannot testify about their practices in a proceeding involving a violation of the national labor laws. It was against their belief to tell anybody what happens in the FLDS, which of course is the polygamist organization with the prophet Warren Jeffs in jail. Um, the court agreed that RIFRA gave this man the right to refuse to testify as to the practices of the FLDS to find out if there were labor law violations. One of the things that is so annoying <laughs> about the FLDS on these issues is that they manufacture some widget that the Defense Department buys that nobody else manufactures they make a boatload of money from the government, but they don't have to answer to the labor laws, including the child labor laws. Many young children work in their plants. So that's one RIFRA case. Another one is the Gitmo detainees. The Hobby Lobby is a wonderful opening, not because they're for-profit corporations, uh, but because they think that person must also include non-resident detainee so they've asked for the right to engage in communal prayer, which is not permitted at Gitmo because that's where they collude, that's where they pass messages. And they have also uh, asked for a right not to have a female guard because it's against his religious beliefs to have a woman touch him. And when she would have to hold his arm because he's shackled from top to bottom, that would violate his religious beliefs. So he demanded that he have a right to a man. The good news is that this is just a federal statute. The second good news is that it is unconstitutional to apply it to the states. So the states are not bound by Hobby Lobby. Even the state refers are not bound by Hobby Lobby. It's a federal interpretation of a federal statute. What that means is that a state right now, the state of Washington, could pass a law that says Every female employee has a right to contraceptive coverage, and if she doesn't get it, it's a violation of her civil rights, and there's no lesser restrictive way of serving her needs. If Washington were to do that, all the Hobby Lobby stores in Washington would have to provide those women with contraceptive coverage. <laughs> and right now, there are politicians in uh, heated races in Washington who have proposed that just that. They're figuring it out. They're not controlled by it. So what's next? 
Well, what's next is finally what I've been hoping for for years. After the court declared Bernie, uh, in Bernie that RIFRA was unconstitutional, and then I saw them going back to Congress, I started calling groups to say, you have no idea what you are up against. There is a statute that is going to undermine your interests, and you need to do something about it. I called the National Organization of Women as one of the groups I called. They hung up on me. Uh, you know, at the time, I sounded like a lunatic, right? I mean, a rational lunatic, but a very lunatic. Now, I don't. Now, I'm right. Finally, the ACLU, People for the American Way, Americans United, Freedom From Religion Foundation, reproductive rights groups, women's rights groups, including now, thank God, thank you, thank you, children's advocates, are all joining together. I thought the best question of the afternoon was, what is FFRF doing with other groups? It's going to take the kind of coalition of Americans to either repeal or a death by a thousand amendments, the RIFRAs. So let me just close by saying the exemptions that I hope that that coalition will fight for in every state and at the federal level and let the religious groups argue that these interests should stay covered. First, I think it ought to be clearly stated in every RIFRA that it ha does not trump civil rights, whether it's rights for women, race, shouldn't be able to trump it. But how about a line in each RIFRA that says it has no effect in cases involving the death of children, the sexual abuse of children, or the abuse or neglect of children? Let them defend the right to do that. They won't. And finally, there are two things that we need to see happen. We need to see the attorney's fees provision taken out. Right now, religious groups aren't paying their own fees. They're being paid for by other groups expecting the government to pay for their fees. And I tried to find out before tonight whether or not Hobby Lobby has asked for the federal government to pay its fees yet. Um, I didn't see it yet. I'm hoping the Alliance Defending Freedom does, because that will be hilarious, um, just because I'll write about it. Um, and finally, there has been a move last spring, if you noticed, to have state referees that clearly empower private disputes to be covered by RIFRA. So the, the baker who doesn't want to bake a cake for same-sex marriage would have the ability to reject that customer because they are homosexual. Or the white supremacist that owns the tavern would be able to keep minorities out. Or the black supremacist would be able to keep whites out. That is the bill that Arizona was considering and that Jan Brewer vetoed. And why did she veto it? Because the NFL and Major League Baseball threatened to pull their team. <laughs> discrimination against religion, discrimination against atheists, discrimination based on race, gender, has no place in our society. I hope we'll wipe out RIFRA. Thank you.